instead of saying that distress tolerance methodologies or distress tolerance techniques aren't any use in the real world, which is what I was saying, and whether anyone agrees with me or not is another matter entirely, but what I was saying was purely concerned with distress tolerance, which is kind of a big thing now. We hear people talking about it quite a lot. And the reason people talk about it quite a lot, I think, is because it sounds good. We know distress is a bad thing, so that means to be able to learn some way of tolerating it must be a good thing. So that makes sense why we would like the sound of it. But not only is it the case that distress and tolerance can't ever work in the real world, by exactly the same logic, none of our strategies, none of them whatsoever, not even one of them, can ever work in the real world. Not ever, ever, ever. So no techniques for mental health can work in the real world. Other techniques may, may work and often can work, but we're not concerned with them here. So the reason that strategies aren't going to work is because strategies, by definition, can only work in a logical continuum. So first we have to be able to talk about what a logical continuum is which is kind of simple enough in one way, but we also have to be able to apply it to our everyday life, which is not so simple. It's not so simple because we live almost all of the time within the continuum of logic, which is the same thing as David Bohm's system of thought. They're just two ways of talking about the same thing, only the system of thought apply specifically to our thinking, obviously enough. Whereas the continuum of logic doesn't have to. We can talk about that in a more abstract sense. So the, the point that's hard to understand or hard to explain is that we spend most of our time living in the continuum of logic and actually it's all we know. But more than this, it's all we can know. And the reason it's all that we can know is because we can only know stuff within a logical continuum. The, the um, operation of knowing doesn't work outside of this. So that's one point. And the second point is that this logical continuum is a projection of ours, it's our map, it's our way, well it's not our map but it's the framework within which our maps exist and it's our way of orientating ourselves in the world. But it isn't actually the world because the world isn't actually a, a continuum of logic and that's the hard point to understand because actually we can't understand what a continuum of logic, what is outside the continuum of logic? Because the only way we can understand things is to use logic, so we start using the logic of the continuum of thought or the continuum of logic to understand what is outside of this continuum, and that doesn't work. Even if we do try it, it doesn't work. And most times we don't try because it never occurs to us to try. Because why would it occur to us to try? Because the logical continuum is all we know, and because it's all we know, we don't call it the logical continuum, we just call it, we don't call it anything. It's just the world, it's like a fish swimming in water. Fishes don't call water anything, I don't think. Well, I assume they don't, I don't really know. But they do talk about fishes and water, don't they? And we're, we're a fish is to water, what we are to, continuum of logic, we sw swim about with it, uh, within it without ever um, 
knowing that it's there because we take it totally for granted. So the system of thought or the continuum of logic is really a dissymmetry. It's an asymmetrical situation. <clears throat> it's a situation, in other words, in which we can, via control or purposeful activity, travel in the direction of either increasing a quantity or decreasing a quantity. And the quantity can be anything, but the simplest way to think of it is distance, so that we can get closer to one pole and further away from the other pole. And the fact that one pole, North Pole, is, or the positive pole, is different from the South Pole or negative pole is why it's called a, an asymmetrical situation because the two directions are di different. And um, actually what I'm saying is pretty pretty damn simple really. It's just that it's just a way of saying that well, up is different from down and left is different from right. And over there is different from over here and hot is different from cold. So we have all these asymmetricalities, all these polarities, and we use it to navigate because without it, we can't navigate. If up is the same as down, or if I can't tell up from down, and it's very rare that we find ourselves in that situation, I can't navigate. If here is no different from there, or in is no different from out. All possibility of navigation, and by navigation, I also mean making sense of the world. We don't have to physically navigate it, but we can't make sense of it either. There's absolutely no way. Not to say that the symmetrical situation doesn't exist, but simply that there's absolutely no way of navigating in it on purpose, and there's absolutely no way of um, describing it or knowing anything about it or making maps or models about it, which is necessary before we can think about it because all maps and models and theories are based on polarity, i.e. the assumption of asymmetricality. So even though this might seem to be um, not necessarily the easiest thing to um, be talking about, it's very, very important if we are to understand why strategies can't work in mental health. So we can all understand asymmetrical situations and we can agree that asymmetrical systems exist. Getting it right versus getting it wrong is an asymmetrical situation because the two are very different. But in reality, there is no getting it right or getting it wrong. Whatever happens is just what happens. There's no evaluation. There's no, um, there aren't right things and wrong things. It's just things. So that's one way of getting a little bit closer to the idea of understanding that our projected polarities are really just a convenience for us and nothing else. We spend a lot of time worrying about being the right way and not being the wrong way. And if we figure out or if we um, find out that we're the wrong way, this causes a lot of distress. I'm talking specifically in mental health here because if I'm in some kind of place that isn't the same kind of place that everyone else is in, I can't compare notes with anyone else. I'm in a very different place or I'm experiencing mental states which are not, which I can't correlate to other people's mental states or other people's descriptions of their mental states. I say that I'm in, um, I say that I'm wrong, I'm broken, or there's something wrong with me. And this causes a lot of distress. On top of the original distress, because it's usually painful mental states that we're talking about. It doesn't have to be. It could be an ecstatic state of mind as well. That would be very um, unusual. But the chances are what we're talking about is a very painful state. Uh, affairs. 
So on top of this pain, we also have this pain of being wrong. Like I remember someone once asking me, is it wrong to be anxious? Which is a perfectly understandable question to ask because it's coming out of this understanding of right and wrong. And so that thought of being wrong on top of everything else, or maybe it's not even just on top of everything else, maybe it's actually more, more painful to be wrong, is more painful to be abnormal, to be um, something that we can't relate to in terms of the framework. And yet, in reality, and this is quite undeniable if we, if we would just pause to consider it, in reality, there are no wrong states. There are no right states. Everything just is what it is. Everything just happens. And the thing that happens is the thing that happens. It doesn't happen in a right way. That's a projection of ours, a category of ours. It doesn't happen in a wrong way. So if we could see this, we would stop spending an awful lot of energy evaluating ourselves as being wrong and then suffering an awful lot on the strength of this evaluation. And the reason we suffer is because when we perceive ourselves to be wrong, that triggers an, a, an escalation of our attempt to be right, i.e. to fix ourselves, to cure ourselves, to kind of remedy the situation. And if that were possible, straight away I'd get back into the comfort zone of being right again and that would be the end of it. But the whole point is we can't do that. And that's why there is so much mental distress. We can't do that, even if people come up to us and say, um, don't worry so much or don't be so down about things, whatever they say, we can't do it. And that's the whole point. If someone asks us or tells us to, to um, you know, to cop on it and sort ourselves out, we can't. And that's the whole point, which is a pretty obvious point when you spell it out, but nobody really seems to know it because they don't get that. So that is one way of looking at why <clears throat> being free from the framework of the thinking mind automatically frees us from a whole heap of unnecessary suffering, suffering that doesn't have to be there, that we heap upon ourselves and that other people heap upon us we also heap upon ourselves. We all do that together. It's not necessary at all. All we have to do is not be thinking, not be operating within the terms of the system of thought, not be operating on the terms of the continuum of logic, which has a very limited applicability. applicability. It doesn't apply to everything. But we don't see that at all. Instead, we think there's a strategy. So, ah, there must be a strategy if I'm feeling so bad. What's the strategy? Hey, Jim, what's the strategy? You know, it makes it sound like we know what we're talking about when we talk about strategies, doesn't it? It really comes across that I know what I'm talking about because it's such a great word. Strategies. Like solutions like talking about solution-focused therapy, solutions. That sounds so good, doesn't it? As soon as you talk about it, you've, you've hit the nail on the head because that's what we all want to hear. But solutions is the same as strategies, which is the same as management, which is the same as control. It's all the same thing, and it only ever works within the system of thought or the continuum of logic. Now, there's two things just two points to make here. One is um, the point that I made before that the continuum of logic isn't the whole of everything. It's only a very minor part, even though it seems very big. And the second part, second point, is that the continuum of logic has something in it which David Bohm refers to as a systematic error. A systematic error is an error that can't be detected because we use thought to detect error. And if there's an error inherent in thought, we'll never detect it ever, 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 because it's the blind spot of thought. So just as there is a systematic error in the system of thought, there's a systematic error in the continuum of logic. And I 
don't want to go into it too much right now because it would take too long and I don't want to get sidetracked if I can help it. So suffice to say that the systematic error in the continuum of logic is its inherent self-contradictoriness, its inherent um, paradoxicality. And when, whenever we really try and push things within the continuum of logic, we hit into this paradox, which is mentioned, it's, it's such a well-known paradox, it's even mentioned in the Bible. And um, it's the liar paradox. But I won't go any further, and I'll talk about that another time, because it, 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 it takes a lot of them um, going into, really, because paradoxes are hard to understand. Well, not necessarily. You might find them easy. Some people might find them easy, but on the whole, they're quite hard to understand. Naturally so, because the thinking mind can only function when it ignores its own inherent paradoxicality. If it sees its own inherent paradoxicality, the whole, paradoxicality, the whole thing is banjaxed. So the point in me making the second point is that when we strategize, to cure whatever problem or glitch is going on. We bring into play the very same um, systematic error that's causing that glitch or problem in the first place. So we're trying to fix a thing with the very same thing that is causing, we're trying to fix a problem with the same very same thing that's causing the problem. And that escalates, it goes round in circles and the, and the glitch escalates and becomes more and more intense. And that's exactly what that that is what happens all the time in a neurotic mental illness, or what used to be called neurotic mental illness. In the neurotic mental health conditions, for example, if I try and flee from fear, fear fear is my strategy. But as I try to flee from fear, the fear gets more intense. So I try to flee more, and that makes the fear get more intense because my method of dealing with the problem is making the problem more intense is the problem and so I spin around and around and around um, escalating and, and the suffering involved in that cycle that vicious circle is escalating the whole time and we could go on to give loads of other examples of counterproductivity like that but I won't because I don't want to get sidetracked too much So that is why we can see straight away that strategies are not great or that they, the very last thing we want to be doing when we're dealing with um, glitches that are caused by the, the um, inherent contradictoriness or the systematic error of um, logic or thought. We really, really don't want to be using thought or using logic to try and fix the problem in that case. We really, really don't. Absolutely, we don't. Now that always tends to sound very hopeless because it's like, oh, we're doomed. We can't do anything to help ourselves. We can't do anything to fix the problem. And then that's a bad moment because here is the problem that cannot be fixed. Absolutely can't be fixed and yet it's a very bad problem. So what do we do with that? And not only that, here is a problem that when we do try to fix it, actually gets to be more of a problem because actually were the truth to be known the problem is our attempt to fix the problem so the problem is not just the problem well it's not the problem at all the problem is us fixing the problem or trying to fix the problem because we can't really fix it so it's us trying to fix it in a counterproductive way so that's that sounds like a terrible message and it is if we believe as we do implicitly believe without knowing that we believe that the continuum of logic is all that there is. But it isn't. It's only a very, very minor thing, as, as I keep saying, even though it doesn't seem like it, even though it seems like the entire universe to us, the entire world to us. And that's that's the hard thing to, to um, not to understand, which would be the wrong word, entirely but to appreciate in any way or to perceive or to get just to get it is really hard 
when we do get it this is clear as clear as anything but it's hard to get so one key key thing to understand is that the symmetrical state is not some curiosity that we might come across in a test tube in the laboratory or under extreme temperature extremely low temperatures extremely high temperatures or under peculiar laboratory controlled conditions it's not an oddity or a rarity or an obscure thing the symmetrical state which physicists sometimes call the state of original symmetry is, us, is the starting off point for everything Everything starts off symmetrical and then the symmetry breaks, which is um, in quantum theory corresponds to the collapse of the state vector or collapse, a quantum collapse where we have lots of different descriptions of what's going on. And then there's a collapse and we've only got the one description, a literal description. So that's how the universe is created. We have lots and lots of potential descriptions. And when we have lots and lots of ways of describing something, an infinite way, and every way is true, then none of them are true. So there is no literal description of reality. And not only that, there is no literal reality because we could look upon the material universe as being a literal reality in the sense that if someone were to drop a brick on your toe, and you've got sandals on instead of work boots and you can say well that that brick is a literal thing the, the brick isn't a metaphor because it if it was a metaphor it wouldn't hurt so much so the symmetry break which causes physicality which causes the material universe is a descent into literality and so is our thinking a descent into literality which just happens to work for the physical universe because the literality of our thinking process correlates to the literality of the of the material universe which is what happens when the state of original symmetry steps down which is not only an idea that we come across in in modern physics it's it was um it can be found talked about in esoteric judaism i kabbalah and um, gnosticism thousands of years ago in great great detail where it's known as emanation it's basically a top-down process where everything starts off in the ineffable state or the intangible state and then collapses into more and more tangible or more and more effable states even though there isn't a word, but it could be. So why it helps to go into this is because it shows that what we're talking about here, the world which has no um, asymmetricalities in it and which we can't navigate in using thought, is actually the real world. and the continuum of logic which we're so at home in isn't the real world at all it's just an abstraction <laughs>